Bonjour and welcome back to the history of the United States since 1877. In part one of this lecture, I covered the civil rights movement of the 1950s and early 60s. First, I identified two major strands in the civil rights movement, one that I call separatist, uh, where the goal is to break apart from white society because you think racism will never end, and to do so in a more violent fashion. And the other strand would be an integrationist strand, where the goal is to be accepted as an equal citizen into white America, and to do so you use nonviolent methods like lawsuits. The late 50s and early 60s in the civil rights movement were dominated by the integrationist schools, where people like Martin Luther King tried to use boycotts, lawsuits, civil disobedience, and nonviolent demonstration as a way to put pressure on Congress to act. With some great successes, because two major acts were passed, the Civil Rights Act of 64, which ended discrimination in public facilities, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which guaranteed that all people, whether they were white or brown or black, could vote on an equal footing. So you'd say, well, things are going well. Uh, don't we stop the lecture here? Well, actually, things didn't go quite as well from the mid-60s forward. In part because, despite all the progress, there was a complaint on the part of many civil rights activists that they were still facing a lot of violence. And indeed, we saw several examples where nonviolent demonstrators uh, were harassed, bullied, or even killed simply for demanding the right to vote. And that did not stop in 64-65. That became very clear during an event called the March Against Fear. This one involved James Meredith, who you may remember had been the first black man to attend the University of Mississippi, who was kind of a positive person who thought that a lot of progress had been made. And to prove his point, he decided to march across Mississippi unarmed, and he was the most famous black person in Mississippi. And he said, nothing will happen to me, you'll see, we have made a lot of progress. And he started his march against fear, and walked maybe like a mile and got shot. So he proved the point, but that was not the point he was trying to make. The point that he did prove was that as late as 1966, it's not possible for a black person in Mississippi simply to walk down the street without being shot at. But getting back to James Meredith, uh, after that march against Spear, there was a protest march, and that's really what launched uh, the Black Power movement, uh, which often involves the younger people who had fought with Martin Luther King, and by fought, I mean uh, they were part of those nonviolent demonstrations. But by the mid-60s, they're getting tired of being bullied and pushed around and threatened, and now they want to fight back, and that's the essence of Black Power. There's a stronger element of self-defense, not aggression per se, you're not going to go out and go to war with white society, that's not the goal, but if you get attacked, uh, you will fight back, self-defense, so quite different from the uh, turn the other cheek aspect of the integrationist movement. Beyond that, there's a desire to be proud of who you are, a, ma a matter of racial pride, and it's true that for many, many centuries in American society, the black race had been denigrated. In fact, uh, the very word uh, denigrated uh, comes from a uh, Latin root meaning black. And you see that elsewhere in the language when you speak of black mailing somebody or black sheep. It seems like whenever the word black comes up in the language, it's for something that is bad. And it's true in the general field of education. Whenever black kids go to school, they are taught that the, uh, the value of beauty and art comes from, you know, the white Mona Lisa painted by Leonardo Vinci, or all that is good comes from Western civilization and Socrates. So there's a pushback against that, uh, to be proud of who you are, meaning of your African uh, origins, and that Africa is not some barbaric jungle, that there are great things coming from Africa. So you might celebrate your own holiday of Kwanzaa, as opposed to worshipping the white Santa Claus. Or you might major in African American studies in college, a topic that did not even exist until the 1960s. Or you might refer to yourself as an African American to distinguish what makes you different from the rest of America. And that recognition of uh, black culture was long overdue. On the other hand, it does set one community apart from the rest of the population, which went against the integrationist attempts of Martin Luther King and others. If you're interested in that racial pride movement, uh, look uh, up another video that I have in the World History section of the course, where I talk about a black leader from uh, the Congo, somebody called Mobutu Sese Seko, and he launched a similar movement called the uh, authenticity movement in the 1960s. So it's a worldwide movement, not just in the US. In fact, even in the US, it had some roots that went back to the 1920s with the poetry of Langston Hughes and others. 
And beyond that, there's a call for like black independence, that maybe you should uh, marry other black people and that uh, young black kids should not be adopted by white families and that you should shop at black businesses and maybe live in a black uh, inner city ghetto with fellow black people as a way to create a more independent community. So quite different from the integrationist impulse of Martin Luther King. One famous example of the growing clout of the Black Power Movement would happen at the Mexico City Olympics in 1968. It's very common for the United States, and specifically black athletes from the US, to dominate the track and field event. And sure enough, at the 110 meter hurdle that year, two of the people on the podium were black Americans. And normally the American flag is raised if you're on the podium, and if you have the gold medal, your ensign is played, then you're on the camera, and you're supposed to cry a bit, and put your hand on your heart, and be proud to be an American. Except that the athletes were members of the Black Power Movement, and did not feel proud to be Americans, because to them, America was a country that had brought the ancestors to the U.S. on both slave ships, had kept them as slaves up until the Civil War, and as second-class citizens after that. So in a sign of protest, a peaceful protest, I may add, uh, they raised their fist and refused to salute the flag. A lot of the scenes that we cover in history tend to resonate with what we're going through today. And if you ever see football players from the NFL taking a knee during the national anthem, it's pretty much the modern day version of that. In the same way that nowadays people get very upset about that sign of protest, don't argue over that, or whether it's disrespecting the flag, while well, you have the same kind of controversies going back in 68. Another figure who is quite representative of that more vocal movement of the late 60s would be Malcolm X, which is not his real name, he was born as Malcolm Little. But in his view, Little, the last name, was a name that had been given to his ancestor, who was a slave, by the planner, and that was indeed uh, the, the norm, that black slaves, as they came from Africa to the US, would lose their original identity and be given a Christian name, and usually the last name was the planner of the plantation. So he had lost his last name, and that's why he became known as Malcolm X. He eventually changed his name altogether, uh, created a, a Muslim name uh, to recreate a new identity. Also rejected the Christian faith, which to him was something that had been imposed upon his slave ancestors, uh, most people in West Africa would either have animist religions, like say, Vodou in Benin, or the Muslim faith, which is quite strong in West Africa, so in his case, he converted uh, back to Islam. Malcolm X is also famous for his great powers of rhetoric, and there is one speech that he gave at Easter in 1964, as I recall, and the whole point at that point was uh, whether black people should have the ballot, because it's before the passage of the Voting Rights Act, and they don't have the ballot, and so he made that speech where he complained that if they didn't get the ballot soon, well, something else might happen. And that became known as the ballot or the bullet speech. And you could see there's a bit of a hint of violence in there, which is quite different from uh, the kind of rhetoric that Martin Luther King would have employed around the same time. Yet another key figure of the Black Power Movement would be a boxer called Cassius Clay, better known to us by the name that he embraced, Muhammad Ali, because just like Malcolm X, he rejected his name as being the name of the planners and the religion as being the religion of the planners. And so he's a convert to Islam, and we now know him as Muhammad Ali. A good symbol for the Black Power Movement, in part because he's a top athlete, who won a gold medal at the Olympics in Rome in 1960, and then turned pro after that, and was world champion on several occasions, back at a time when heavyweight boxing is far more popular than it is today. So beautiful athlete, and also happened to be a shot at the tank, and so it's great uh, for one-liners and interviews. Also happened to be quite politically active, uh, specifically in the 60s when the Vietnam War comes along and young men like himself are supposed to be drafted and go fight in Vietnam. Which to him was definitely not a war he wanted to be in, not because he was not courageous, after all he is a heavyweight boxer, he knows violence, he encountered that in the ring, but because to him the true fight was at home to get equality for black people. So it was pointless trying to speak of democracy in Southeast Asia, where as far as he was concerned, there was democracy in Alabama or Mississippi. Except this is Muhammad Ali, so he's able to explain that in a one-liner much better than I can. Uh, for example, he described the Vietnam War as a war where white people sent black people to fight yellow people. And that's true, a lot of the richer white kids could go to college and get a deferment, or maybe get a doctor's note saying that they had bone spurs or something. Whereas a lot of the poor whites and poor blacks were sent to Vietnam to fight and die there. Or he also said that he didn't think of the Viet Cong, which are the Vietnamese communists, as his enemies because they're not racist. The racist cop that he met, I don't know, somewhere in Mississippi, that's his true enemy. 
and I want to apologize for the language in advance, but that's the historical quote. Uh, the way he put it is, quote, no Viet Cong ever called me n***, unquote. So this put him in the news a lot, not just as a great athlete, but also as a political activist who refused to go to Vietnam. And for a while, his stance was quite unpopular. He was stripped of his boxing title, was threatened with felony and five years in prison, though he managed to claim conscientious objector status, and his case went all the way to the Supreme Court, where he eventually prevailed after several years out of the rings. Later on, he had to regain his uh, title after his legal troubles were over, and that led to a very, very famous bout uh, nicknamed the Rumble in the Jungle because it took place in Kinshasa, Zaire. And again, I'll refer to you to that video on the reign of Mobutu, Zaire being the Congo, it's the same country. Well, the Congo is not exactly uh, the jungle, at least not the capital, uh, Kinshasa, and that was the place where the uh, heavyweight boxing championship final would take place. Uh, between Muhammad Ali, who was trying to regain his crown, and his opponent, George Foreman, who, as it happens, was also African-American. Uh, most of these kind of bouts would be taking place in maybe Madison Square Garden or maybe Las Vegas, so it's kind of a big symbol to put Africa on the map and to say that two people who are descendants of African slaves would now meet for the title world champion in an African town. And best of all, Muhammad Ali won the title. If you're interested in learning more about that particular bout, I would highly recommend the documentary When We Were Kings, which is about the life of Muhammad Ali, and specifically the so-called Rumble in the Jungle. It has some great footage of Ali talking during interviews and such. Or uh, you could watch the biopic where Will Smith uh, replayed Ali, and it's a pretty good movie as well. The last big moment in the life of Muhammad Ali would take place in 1996. Uh, that year, the Olympics were held in Atlanta, Georgia, in the South. And you know how the Olympics work. The question is always, who will be the last person to pass the relay, to pass the torch? And that's a great honor, and usually you reserve that for the biggest athlete in your country. As it turns out, the U.S. has a long and proud history in the Olympics, so there are hundreds of athletes who could legitimately have passed the torch, and that was a big mystery. Who will do that? And at the last minute, who appeared in the stadium? Mohamed Ali who, as you recall, had won the gold medal at the Olympics in 1960, so it was all legit. Though it was a bit of a bittersweet moment because this was not the muscular, smart, impressive Muhammad Ali of the 1960s, this was a shadow of a man, apparently being punched in the head repeatedly by heavyweight boxers is not very good for your health. Another party that would be quite prominent in the late 60s and early 70s would be the Black Panther Party. And there are different ways that you can look at them. The way they described themselves was more as a community activist, that they would be in big cities with large black population, like say Chicago, and then try to help the local kids and such. The way they would be described by the opponents, specifically the police or the FBI, would be in a far less favorable light. Uh, the Black Panther believed in self-defense, so they bought weapons, which was within their right under the Second Amendment, uh, but many people that are otherwise in favor of the Second Amendment were not so in favor when it came to having black people that are very politically active showing up at political meetings armed to the teeth. And so there were a number of raids by the police on their headquarters where they fought back because they believed in self-defense, and that became quite close to the Civil War, uh, where you have some black activists that are in shootouts uh, with the police. Some of the Black Panther Party members were eventually uh, involved in uh, bank robberies as well, so the police went after them hard, in part because of the crimes they committed, but also uh, as an excuse to get rid of a very extreme uh, black activist movement. So they were pretty much dismembered by the early 1970s. So that's a sign that some of the more generous impulses in the mid 50s to early 60s I'm not quite sold ever saying, and so by the late 60s, 70s, you have a more bitter kind of set of race relations. A lot of progress has been made, but clearly not everything has been fixed, and we're kind of still dealing with the after effects of slavery and racism. In a way, is where we are still. We have made a lot of progress, but it's a cup half full, half empty kind of situation. Uh, for example, in 2008, a mixed race president was elected to the White House, which is something that Martin Luther King probably never even dreamed of considering that when Barack Obama was born uh, in many states, the fact that his parents were mixed-race marriage uh, would have been illegal altogether. Uh, so it's a big step forward in that regard. On the other hand, when he was elected president, ugly rumors started to swirl around that he was not a true American, that he must have been born in Kenya, there's no way uh, that he could be an American and be a, a brown skin at the same time. Please show me your birth certificate. And even when he was forced to do it, people still did not believe that he was a real American. 
In many ways, this would bring us back to the terrible Dred Scott decision of 1857, when the Supreme Court ruled that people who are black cannot be ever American citizens. Another controversy with a long historical legacy would be controversies surrounding police brutality. These have happened for many, many decades, but nowadays with the proliferation of cell phones, you have two competing narratives. One where the police says that they killed an unarmed young black teenager in self-defense due to a tragic misunderstanding, and the other narrative where a cell phone recording tells otherwise. Next thing you know, you have demonstration telling you that black lives matter, no, blue lives matter, and things get very ugly very fast. So looking at the history of racial relations since the 1950s or 1960s would be a litmus test to decide whether you're an optimist, whether you see life as a glass half full kind of thing or glass half empty. Speaking of racial controversies, the next item on the agenda will be to talk about George Cordy Wallace, an arch segregationist from the state of Alabama in the early 60s, but that's a topic of a whole other lecture. Au revoir and goodbye.